Have you got that film? Have we got that? <laughs> just replay that at the end. We can just reuse that at the end. So if it's a shit ending, we just replay the applause. It'll be fine. It'll be great. Have you all been to a round table event before? Or is it your first? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Cool. So I know I've changed the title on here because I had like a bit of a brainwave uh, today and rem remembered something. So I thought I would just tweak it slightly for, for this purpose. And it gives me the chance to... Uh, attack Paul, not in a, an aggressive way, but I'm just going to demonstrate uh, like a martial art move uh, on Paul as well, that's cool. So very briefly, I'm just going to explain who I am, not that that's necessarily important, but just so you can kind of understand where I'm coming from with what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. So my name is James Ashford, as Paul said. Um, there we go. I'm the founder of Go Proposal, which is a pricing and proposal software that, that I, I first developed for my uh, digital agency that I had a few years ago. And then now I've adapted it for accountants, and that's a, a SaaS product that we, that we sell, that we launched earlier this year. Um, I'm author of a book called Selling to Serve, which is about how do we, how do we uh, sell our services to our clients in such a way that we give them the most value and we get them to the point where they actually want to buy from us rather than us having to, to sell to them. I did mean to bring some copies tonight, and I have some rare unsigned copies as well that I was going to bring. But, um, Those are more expensive. Yeah, they're, yeah it. they're much rarer. Yeah, yeah, that's it. But I forgot to bring them, so if anybody wants one, just let us know and I'll make sure I send one through to you, so that's cool. Um, I'm the director at my accountancy place as well, and I used to own my own digital marketing agency, which I set up about 10 years ago, and so I'm going to be just kind of referencing that as well. Uh, I will be talking, I'm not going to talk for the full half an hour because I'd like to get a discussion going, and I want you to actually leave with something tonight and actually take something and be able to implement it into your agency and actually make a difference. It's all well and good coming to events like this and hearing things and perhaps being inspired, but if you don't take anything back to your agency and actually make any meaningful changes, then there was no real point in coming. So what, what I always encourage you to do is to take something and implement one thing. We're never looking for perfection, our agency, we're just looking for progress. So if you just take one idea and implement it and, and try it out, that's all we're ever looking to do to just kind of take one step forward at a time. I'm gonna have to go and actually go go manual on this. Let's pull this over here so we can do this. Okay, so there we go, working out. So let's explain the challenges that I faced in my agency before I kind of had to get someone to come in and intervene and give me some help. So we weren't getting paid enough for the hard work that we were doing, and also it wasn't consistent. So there was like some projects that we'd work on where we felt we were getting paid enough and get paid right. And then other projects that we seem to just do everything for a client and we weren't getting paid enough for. So we never kind of felt that we had control. And it's, I, I think it really came down to what I looked at afterwards was that we'd never really got our pricing right and pricing consistent. And so we, we, did, we ended up doing a lot of work around that. We were providing far too many services to our clients. And one of the mistakes I think that a lot of agencies make is they're all proud to say, we are a full service agency. We provide everything. And the reason why that happened is because you started off doing something and then let's say it was web design and then a client said, can you optimize? And you're like, shit, I think we can optimize it. We can make some more cash here. <laughs> so we'll quickly learn how to optimize. Then, so, then you realize the logo is crap. You say, I think we could develop your logo quicker. So all of a sudden you get all these different bolt-ons and you're doing all these things that you're not an expert in, that you're not making profit in all of these different areas. And you think it's cool to kind of position yourself as a full service agency with a one-stop shop. No one else needs to go anywhere. But you kind of end up backing yourself into a corner because you can't be an expert in all these things not everything's making you money you end up running around and it, it just doesn't quite work out you know we'd be profitable in certain areas then all of a sudden we start doing printing for a client because we've designed the letterhead so we'll do printing as well that's fine you want to need to mess up one printing job and you're taking out all your profit in an, and we're like why are we doing that let's just get rid of it so we, we realize we're providing far too many services the other issue that we had was our sales cycle was too long. So from the moment that somebody inquired about working with us to the point where they actually signed up could be months and we didn't feel that we were in control of that. We'd kind of be dictated to by the clients. So if they, if they said, this is our process, this is how we're going to do things, or this is how we're going to, you know, choose who we're going to work with or whatever, we'd kind of be at the mercy of everyone else and everyone all your different clients that you're working with have different processes. And so again, you lose control at that point. Um, the payment schedule left us vulnerable. And so what would happen is we had a, a payment schedules that we had in place. We, we 
did various w ones for, for our projects. And just to give you an idea of our projects, maybe like our smaller projects would be like five or six grand. Our average project would be about 10 grand. 20 grand would be a good project. And we had a couple of 40 grand projects, if just like as a, a rough idea. The way that we would structure the payments, again, maybe was the client would dictate, dictate it sometimes, you know, but I guess for the smaller projects, we'd kind of do 50% up front and then 50% on completion or something like that. For a larger project, we may take 50% up front if we, could, if we could take that or maybe even smaller, it might be 20% and then different milestones throughout the project. So let's say 20, 20, 20, 20, all the way throughout of a project or something like that. And that would be dependent upon clients signing off certain milestones. So there was no real theory about it. It was just kind of what felt right. What can we get away with? And what are other people doing? And so what ends up happening is you look to other agencies and say, well, how do they do it? Well, we'll kind of do something similar to that. But it's never really thought through in terms of how should it be? What, what do we need it to be like? So our payment schedule left us very vulnerable. And there were about three projects that we had where we'd overexposed ourselves. And by the time you, you realized that actually shit, we've done all this work, the client hasn't paid us. They were a great client to start with, made all these promises and, and, and we thought they were wonderful. And we gave them a discount to start with. So we knew they were gonna be the best client ever. And, and we just, they just loved us. And then everything just kind of nosedived after that. And because you've got other people working on projects, it's only when you realize we, we're too far stretched now, we owe suppliers money, we've got issues here. And we had that about three times. And it's because of our payment structure and we didn't have the cash flow um, correct. The other one was that the, the client was in control of the milestones. So we'd have different milestones throughout a project, uh, such as getting the initial design signed off. So when you're happy with the initial design, you sign it off, that completes that milestone, and that's gonna trigger the next 20% or the next payment term, whatever that's going to look like. And so it might be signing off the initial design, signing off the, the wireframe of the website, approving the final copy, approving the website or something like that. So let's say you had five milestones throughout a project, 20% each, the client would be essentially in control of when those got signed off. Therefore, if the client's in control of signing off the milestones, the client's therefore in control of the project. And if the client's in control of your project, the client's now in control of your business. And because you've got multiple clients working on, that you're working for, you've now got multiple clients all in control of your business telling you when money's gonna come to you and why it's gonna come to you. And what can happen is, and you'll have all experienced this, you'll have started with a client, and you'll have put some clear milestones in place in terms of when they're gonna sign things off and you may have even attached certain dates to things. And when that client sat down with you, that was their intention, that was what was gonna happen. But you know, we all encounter challenges in business, you have staffing challenges, all sorts of different problems. So you started that project with the best intentions and they started it with the best intentions with you. You've now no idea what's happening in that business. Anything could have happened. They could have lost a member of staff. They could have lost a key contract. They could have had a tax bill or whatever. And all of a sudden now, it's not in their interest to get you a milestone signed off to, for them to give you release that next piece of cash. And so what you can encounter is that they will string a, a milestone on, say, oh, we're not happy, we want some more designs. We, 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 yeah, we're not, yeah, we're not happy with that. And they could keep you going for ages and ages. You think it's because your work isn't good enough or that you, you, you never understood the brief, right? They might be giving you some grief for it. You're not, you're not getting your money and you're working far harder than you ever imagined th that you would do. And it might be nothing to do with you. It might be all other factors. I remember once we had a project that, that start started by this point we had we, we sorted our sales cycles out so I cycle out so i had signed him up there and then on the spot but what happened was we started a project and they, they were a big telesales company employing 60 members of staff and that we signed the project up on the tuesday and on the wednesday they had a power cut to the build it took them out for two weeks which is for someone who's on a in a call center was a huge huge problem this set them back for months Thankfully, we had the deposit paid, but we were able to now hold off with the project. But had that been midway through a project, it could have caused all sorts of complications and problems. And obviously, you know, you can be accommodating with some clients, but ultimately, this is your business and you need to make sure that it works for you. So you'll have heard the expression that cash is king. And I think I understand what that means. I'm looking like accountancy people, because I'm not an accountant. I'm looking like accountancy people to see what that means. But it ultimately means that, you know, you can, you can win work, you can produce great quality work, 
you can be winning projects, you can have people agreeing to pay you and you could have secured contracts and stuff, but unless you have that cash, you haven't got anything. Because that, that is what it's all about. We need to get that cash in. And obviously we do things for the love of it. We do it because we're passionate about what we do. You all came into this industry because you were passionate and motivated and fired up about something. And then all of a sudden we have to start talking about this cold, ugly thing called cash. But ultimately that's why you're all in business. We're all in business to make money. It's very, very simple. And the reason why we need to make money is because that's going to give us the life that we want. And so we have to get down to brass tacks here and we have to recognize that what we're doing is to make money. Yes, we're going to change the world. Yes, we're going to give value. Yes, all that stuff. I know all that stuff. But ultimately, if we don't get money, we can't do that stuff that we, we love doing in our business or in our life as well. So we need to get that right. So cash is, is king. And whoever controls the flow of cash controls the business. So if you're controlling the flow of cash coming into your business, then you are in control. And if you have let go of that control to the client and they're going to control now when the money is going to come to you, all of a sudden now they're in control of your business. And I know what it can feel like that you can have multiple clients kind of stringing you along or, or whatever. And, you know, they might not be doing it for bad reasons. Like I say, they might be encountering challenges as well. But ultimately, you've lost control at this point and we don't want that to happen. So I'm going to show you how to control someone during a throw. Okay, so this was the bit, obviously, it's like the next logical step, right? So I'm a, a second Dan uh, black belt in a martial art called Goshin Kai, which to kind of sum up is, it's, you avoid trouble at all costs. You, you, people can swear at you, they can say what they want, you walk away, if you feel uncomfortable in the environment, you leave, you go home, you, you just avoid trouble at all costs. But if it kicks off, we're gonna destroy everybody as fast as possible in the most brutal way. That's kind of the, it in a nutshell, right? <laughs> So, we can, we can come on to that. My little girl's six. She's only got one fighting move, which is just thumbs in eyes. That's all she's learned so far. That, but but anyway, we're not, we're not going to do that tonight. But, but what, because I'm a creative person, you know, as, as creatives, my background's a designer, I'm a product designer. As creative people, we think laterally. And so we'll learn something over here and we always look at how can we apply it over here as well. So I did this martial art for 10 years and I was always kind of looking for how can I use this in other areas of my life as well. And throwing is a, a really important aspect of, of the martial art and it, it kind of lends itself, or it's taken aspects from judo and from jiu-jitsu and various other things. And there's a couple of key principles in how you throw somebody that you need to have right in order to make it work. So Paul, could I just invite you up here? Thank you. Please be careful. I don't think I know, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's fine. So a throw is essentially taking somebody who's upright or standing or upright of some sort to the floor. So it could be really simply just dragging someone down or it could be elaborate and you throw them and you throw them through there, whatever, okay, okay. But it doesn't need to move. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> but either way, we're going to take a person and we're going to throw them. That's the plan. So if you can just come here, Paul. That's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So just, you need to be gentle with me. So we have, we have kind of practiced this very, very briefly. So if you can grab me, Paul. <laughs> Can use my microphone, Paul? It's just there. Thank you. You got that? That's okay. So this is Paul grabbing me in a choke. So, so in, a, in a bar or whatever, someone's put behind me. Thank you for filming this, Andrew. This is the only part you film. Thank you. Yeah. And now someone's grabbed me. Okay. So his intention is to strangle me or throw me to the floor or do whatever. So he, but I've now got to take control of the situation and throw him. That's, that's the idea. But in this position here, he has completely taken my balance. If Paul were to just disappear, just like a, and just ping and disappear at this point, I would fall to the floor because he has taken my weight. And that is the fundamental rule of throwing that we can't have. It, it will never work. So while ever he's got my balance and he could disappear at any point, I'm going to collapse to the floor. So the way this would work is if someone grabs hold of you like this, I've got to take the balance. I've got to take it. So I'm in the position here and now I can, I can throw it at, the, at this point, okay? But the point is the fundamental difference between how this is and how it was. I'm not leaning on him. I'm in a strong position. I'm in a strong stance. And if he was to disappear at this point, I stay standing. I'm not moving anywhere. But if you grab on, come back on, Paul. If I was to at this point, he stacks it to the floor. Did you get it? Thank you, Paul. Round of applause for Paul. That's awesome. So some of the throws are more elaborate and we sweep in and we throw, etc., etc. We throw them over our heads and various other things. But the point is, is at any point throughout the throw, 
the instructor could press pause at any point throughout a complete movement and at that point I should be in balance, not leaning on him, not relying upon his weight, not having my balance away because at that point I could fall. What I did was I applied that philosophy and that principle to the payment structure that I had throughout any project that I did with the mindset that a client could disappear at any point and I will never be left exposed. I will never fall to the floor at that point. Does that make sense? And that involves me getting the money in for our project, me being able to pay suppliers and various other things. And what this fundamentally did was it meant that we was in a far better position, we got our money in quicker, we were able to complete projects better, and we got far better results from our suppliers as well, which I'm gonna to explain to you as well. So the fundamental difference was when we applied this thinking, and it wasn't just this, we brought in business mentors and various other people to come and help us. The first thing we did was, the mentor sat with me and said, show me your, your project, show me all the work that you do in our life. Let me show you all the amazing stuff that we do. You will be so impressed. And I've given this massive list and he was like, that's ridiculous. Why do you think you can offer all this stuff? That's just crazy. You have lost control by doing all this stuff. And it's because you just bundled all this stuff on. And so we cut out 75% of everything that we offered to clients. We, we, passed, refer, we uh, passed referrals to other people, we made, got some kickbacks on various other things, and in other cases, we just passed the work away. We just became an expert in the, in the area that we focused on. If you look at Steve Jobs, when he came back into Apple, when Apple was failing, he came back in. I can't remember how many products they had, I think they had something like 400 products, and he got them down to 10. That was Apple's breakthrough by cutting out all of the other things that they just weren't making any money on. And if, and if you read anything by Jason Fried, who's the guy from 37 Signals who developed Basecamp, he says half all of the services you provide and then half it again. Get, 75, get rid of 75% of what you do. So I would encourage you, you know, if you can do one thing tomorrow when you go back to your office, is to look at what you could actually cut out, what you, you could remove, what don't you enjoy doing, what doesn't make you money, what could leave you vulnerable, and I'm sure there'll be things that you could, could get rid of, and you, you won't lose clients as a result of it, and you might lose whatever, anyway. The next one is we standardized our pricing and we charged for everything. So we developed a pricing tool that allowed us to sit with a client and to agree every aspect of, of what they wanted, and we applied a principle to this, which is how you might buy a car. So one of the mistakes that we see a lot of agencies making is that they price for everything. So if an agency sold cars, this is how they would sell a car. You want a car? Yeah, cool. Do you want wheels? Yeah, brilliant. How many wheels? Yeah. Do you want a spare one in the boot? Okay, we'll put you a spare one in as well. Do you want a music system? Brilliant. Do you want a volume knob on it? Do you want a play? They would go through everything like this, thinking that that's what their clients want, rather than saying, okay, we've got the Audi there. Do you want the sports package or not? Do you want the the uh, what a Bang & Olufsen sound system, which comes with da 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 which is gonna make you, it's gonna sound incredible when you're driving along. They're selling the value, and they're selling all the different, the, the things that, that would go with it. They're not selling your individual components, which is when you look at a lot of agencies they do, it becomes ridiculous. So we simplified what we were selling, we standardized our pricing, and we charged for everything. So you buy the website, and we'll buy it as part of this, you'll get our, um, we'll get 10 stock photos for the website. That is part of the package of what we do. If you want more, perfect. You buy our 25 stock photos bundle and it's this much. That's how it works. When we did that one thing, I remember that the day we did that, I went into price a project the following day and we, would, we charged three times more for it than we would have done the previous day and the client signed up. And I was like, oh God. I was gutted that he signed. I thought, shit, what about all them clients I've sold projects to that I could have been charging three times more for the same project? The next thing we did uh, was that we agreed the pricing whilst we were sat with the client. So this came back to the, the, the pricing tool that we developed and we were able to produce a proposal while we were sat with the client because what happens is if you're not able to do that, ultimately the client's going to leave, you're going to guess, you're going to have your fingers crossed and you're going to send something away to them and hope for the best, at which point you lose control of the process. We were able to sit with our clients, show them what a project would look like and then actually agree the pricing. How does that look? And I remember the first time, the big breakthrough that we had with this is uh, it was a, 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 um, a woman and she took a, a, a wallet out of a, a bag or whatever it was and she took a card out and she handed the card over the table and we took the deposit and started the project. And I, I came out of the office because she gave me the card like it was a normal thing to do. She gave me a card and I went to the office and I'm like, Megan, she, I have no idea how we take money off this. Just find a way of taking money off that. 
no idea, but it felt good, right? And then we put a process in place to take the payments. But that, that was a, a big changing point that we took control and were able to agree uh, the price with, with people whilst we were sat with them. We had 90% of the money in after week two of a project. This was the game changer. If you're gonna take one thing from this, and this will frighten you. This idea will frighten you because it frightened me. And the guy that taught me this was a guy who did uh, loft conversions. He was doing projects that were 50 to 80,000 pounds, his loft conversions. He was ripping roofs off houses and bringing loads of different aspects in, in doing so. He turned the house into chaos while he did it. He says, all you're doing is building some websites for people. Get a grip, this is easy, right, okay. They will go with it. So what we did was, we, when we signed up a project, the moment we signed up for it to secure the start date, we took 10%. If you wanna work with us, you take, we're taking 10% off you right now, and that's gonna secure your start date. Two weeks before the project started, the project's gonna start here, Two weeks before the project started, we took another 40%. So we would go into the project with 50% of the value already paid up front, similar to what we had before, so no great shakes there. But sometimes these projects could be several months out, we've already got 10% in the bank. But this was the next part. Let's say, for example, it was an eight week project for argument's sake. So eight weeks, just say eight weeks, eight weeks after week two, we would take another 40% of the value of the project, leaving 10% of the value of the project for the client to have to sign off when they were happy with everything. We never had anyone challenges on this for like 20, 30, 40,000 pound projects. And if people did ask us why we did this, because they were, it wasn't, uh, maybe they're not experienced it with other companies before, what we explained was, we need, the money, we need the money here so we can fund your projects. I'm going to assemble the very best people on your project to work and we pay our suppliers fast. We pay them very quick. We have some freelancers that we're, that we, that we're working that we bring on specialists on certain, on certain uh, parts of the project and we pay them with a very quick turnaround. We pay them within seven days of working with them. And so we need enough money to make sure that we can fund your project. Does that make sense? It's a challenge. It, it, I thought people aren't going to go with this, but it changed everything because it meant that we were in control, going back to the throwing idea, but it didn't matter when anybody cut off throughout a project, it meant that we had enough money to fund the whole project. The next part of it, and even if you don't, even if you don't go for this, if you changed it, and what you can do is, if you, let's say you did have a client who felt uncomfortable, you say, well, I'll tell you what we'll do, is we'll split that one out, we'll do 20% there, and two weeks later, we'll do another 20%, if you wanted to, but either way, after four weeks into a project, you've still got your cash, that's, that's the point. And if you didn't get paid the last 10%, it's not the end of the world, but the client feels in control because they have the option to pay that. But the key part here, however you structure this, is that you've got to be in control of the milestones. So you don't want it to be that payment is due when you sign off the initial ideas. You want that payment is due when we send you the initial ideas. Yeah? We don't, we don't, we don't need you to be signing off when you've approved the wireframe. You sign off when we send you the wireframe or to release the wireframe. We're, we're going to be in control of when those payments are coming out. And now you've got things like go cardless. It's far easier to take the money off the client. You agree all up front and through, if you've got your invoicing set up with zero, you can trigger off that payment and you can take the cash off the client. Am I right? Yeah. So you can agree these milestones and in the brief it says, when we send you this through, we will be taking that next 40%. You send a note, an email to the client explaining what's gonna happen and a week later, that payment's gonna come out via GoCardless. You can do all that? You can, you can even set up the payments in advance to go cardless. Yeah. Have them scheduled out over the week that we've talked about. Yeah. So that yeah, absolutely. So it's far easier now for you to be in control of, of the money coming into you. And this had all sorts of knock-on effects for us. It, it meant that you know, we were far more stable, we were able to bring in better staff. And one of the knock-on effects it had with our clients, and this was kind of one of the things I mentioned here with a, a counterintuitive method of paying suppliers, is that we had a belief of our, our if you think about it, I've got, I've got suppliers that I've worked with for years. I've st I still work with some of them now on, on projects. Some are freelancers, some are small little companies, and they're all little specialists in what they do. I've got a guy in Australia that I've worked with for years, a guy in York, and various people that I will bring into projects. These people hate dealing with clients. That's why they work for an agency. They don't like talking to people, okay? They, they, never, they just want projects to be passed to them. They wanna get paid, they wanna get on with the project, that's what they love doing. They hate chasing clients for money, 
and they hate dealing with clients. They hate negotiating. They don't want any part of that. They don't even want to talk to human beings, okay? I've got people that work with me that are like that. So what I agreed with them is I will remove all of that pain for them. I will get your money. And what I said to my suppliers is I will never give you a project to do unless I have got all of the money to be able to pay you for that project. So the moment you hand me the invoice for that, I will pay you that same week. So you hand me the invoice on the Thursday, you get paid on the Friday. I will pay you that week. So we'll do a pay run on a Friday. So as long as you've got it into me that week, you will get paid on that Friday. But in return, I never want to have to snag your projects. You do all the snagging. I never want to have to, to, to go through that thing. I want a priority service from, from you. If you've got three projects coming in and you've got mine coming through the door, I need you to prioritize mine and to get mine done ahead of other people. If there is an urgent situation where we've got a website down or we've got this, I need you to be able to get on this on evenings and on weekends and this is the time frame I expect you to be able to come back to me to sort these problems out. I was able to get a far better level. I never, I never negotiated on price with them, but what I was able to do was to negotiate on higher levels of service. So now when I'm speaking to my clients, I can say I am bringing in the very best people into this project who are going to work to the highest levels on, on what it is that we're doing. That is why you're gonna pay that. And I'll tell them how I pay my suppliers. I'm not gonna, you know, supplier, freelancers and small, they hate it when you say to them, can you pay me? No, because we've not been paid for my client yet. Yeah, what, how does that affect the relationship? It's not for that, that's not fair, that situation. It's my job to get the money off the client and, and to be able to pay the supplier. But that can only happen if you get the payment structures right and you take control of the project. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, and I've worked with my, my suppliers for many, many years on, on that. And that's sort of there. We, we paid our suppliers quicker in return for a priority service. So I'm just gonna share a few final points with you and then we can open it up and have a chat about it and you can challenge me or you can share your experiences or whatever. So this is a slightly different point. You've got to control how the client shows up in the first place. You are all into marketing, you're all into digital marketing, you all understand marketing. One of the things that you've got to be able to do is you've got to have ideally long-term nurturing processes so that by the time a client turns up to you, they're already pre-sold, they love what it is that you do and they believe that you are the only possible solution for them. You know, people say, oh, I get all my work through referrals. So you say, oh, Paul's interested, go and speak to him. That's a nightmare because now that's just down to look. Is this gonna work or is it not gonna work? I would much rather someone have entered a three-month nurturing process where they've watched videos, been on webinars, been, had content sent, read my blog articles, read my books. When people sign up for Go Proposal, the longer they have been in our nurture process, the better clients they are when they get to us. Because they, they, they turn up saying, this is exactly what I want and they know why they want it. Because I've told them, yeah? I've, we've got an agency, a really good friend of mine, do a million pound agency, a million pound turnover agency with an 80% profit margin. They have six, 12, and 24 month nurturing processes before people turn up. And when they turn up, they spend, they buy, and they get incredible results from them. So I know that's a slightly off topic, a slightly different issue, but the reason I'm saying that is because the rest of the stuff I'm gonna show you, if you've got a challenge saying clients will never do that, I would challenge you back and say, are you controlling how they turn up in the first place? You know, if somebody wants to meet with me and have a strategy call with me, they have to have watched a 40 minute video beforehand. I track whether they've watched that video or not. If they've not watched the video, I'm not having a meeting with them. Because what's the point? Because if they're not prepared to watch that video, they're not gonna do anything I ask them to do moving down the line, so I'll just cut them out at that point. Do you know what I mean? It might seem harsh, but I'm telling you, that if, you, if you've got your nurturing process right and they're showing up in the right way, you, you're gonna have a far better relationship with them. I'd sooner lose them earlier on than get into a project with them and realize they weren't a, a great client at that point. So the next thing is so control how the client sh shows up, control what you're selling. Don't allow your clients to dictate to you what you should be selling and what services they wanna buy from you. You know what your specialisms are, you know where you can make your money, you know what you enjoy doing. Stick to your guns. You're not gonna lose people on, because it's a full service agency. It's very easy for them to go somewhere else and pay for that there and pay with you that. It's not, it's not the end of the world, so don't fall into that one. You control what you, you're selling and what you enjoy doing. Control what they pay. You, you can't have people demanding discounts or saying, I wanna pay this or I wanna pay that. You've gotta have a very clear pricing structure for how you're gonna sell your services. And if you just do this, if you just charged for everything your clients had from you, you'd be far more profitable than just all them little bits that you sell. 
oh, we'll just do that for you. Yeah, we'll just throw that in for you. You can't go around Asda and say, I just fancy, you can just chuck some of this stuff in. Yeah, you can have it in, you're gonna pay for it. If they want something from you, they're gonna pay for it. The next one is control how they pay. Yeah, control how they pay. So go cardless, I would insist they have to pay through go cardless. If somebody signs up for go proposal, they pay through Stripe. We have people ringing up saying, I wanna pay this way. I'm like, I'm sure you do, but that's not how we work. And if I'm gonna lose you as a client, then I'm prepared to lose you as a client because we've set up our payment, payment mechanisms for, for certain reasons. They trigger off certain things and I'm not gonna kind of move our stuff for you. I'm, I'm sorry, so if you want it, then that then comes back to if they showed up in the right place and they love it and they, they don't want it enough if they're not prepared to do that. Does that make sense? But if they're showing up in the right way, they'll not go for it. So you've got to control how they're going to pay you. The next one is control when they're going to pay you. And you've got to be in control of that in terms of the, the, they're not milestones that they're dictating, they're milestones that you're dictating and they're in the, the, the amounts of uh, cash that you want when you want them. And yeah, the final one is control the completion of milestones. If you just want to, if you've got your phones with you, you just want to do a snapshot of that and just, just grab that. That for me is how you control your clients, it's how you control your projects, it's how you control your income, it's how you control your business, it's how you control your life. I know this is I'm getting like on my high horse here, but the reason you're all in business is to have the life that you want. If you can't control your business, you can't control your life. And it all comes down to controlling all of those key areas because all of those impact the money that you've got coming into your business. Um, a couple of ways we can help you. One is go and take all that lot and go and do it and share it at the next round table. We put these events on here to help you. So that's our gift to you and you can go and do that and that's cool. If you want to fast track that, there's a couple of things you, that we can do. Uh, we've got a, a cash flow audit service that we can do where we'll do a run through through my accounting place where we can do a full run through from how a client first encounters you, how they sign up, what payment mechanisms you have in place, what what. Uh, how you invoice them, how you take money off them, and we'll do a full run through and produce a report showing you how you can improve it. It's not a, an expensive service at all, but if you're interested in that, have a chat with Paul or Amanda afterwards. And then the other thing we've got is Go Proposal. Go Proposal is the price and proposal software that I have. Um, it's 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 started off for agencies, then we adapted it for accountants. We do have an agency version that kind of sits behind the scenes. You have to ask us for it, and we can release it to you. Um, if you're looking for something that's going to be all really stunning and beautiful that you can control and embed videos in and have all these amazing images and completely control every single font and all this type of stuff, this is not it. If you want something that's going to control the way that you price and how you're going to charge money to clients and how you're going to get it off them, that is it. There's a very clear difference here. Between, this is What I explain is this is a closing tool, it's not a selling tool. This is the part where you propose, it's the bit where you say, will you marry me? This is the deal, let's get down to it, right, okay? This is not the, do you wanna go on a date? Do you wanna have a coffee? Do you know all this? It's not the courtship process. It's not the sales process. It's the nail the deal process. So if you, if you think that's of interest, either give us a call and we'll show you a demo and see if it's of, of, of use to you. But there are a couple of ways that we can kind of help you to fast track what I've shown you as well.